Y'all know me. Know how I earn a living. This shark, swallow you whole. I value my neck a lot more than 3,000 bucks, Chief. Find him for three, but I'll catch him and kill him for ten. Ten thousand dollars for me by myself. For that you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. You yell shark, we've got a panel on our hands on the 4th of July. Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn, I pulled a tooth the size of a shot glass out of the wreck of the boat out there, and it was the tooth of a great white. A what? You're gonna need a bigger boat. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name into the National Geographic. Now, I'm not saying that this is not the shark. It probably is, Martin. It probably is. It's a man-eater. It's extremely rare for these waters. But the fact is that the bite radius on this animal is different than the wounds on the victim. What if I were to tell you that the movie Jaws takes place over 12 calendar days? That's correct. That's what we are going to do today on the Jaws Obsession. Welcome back. We are going to tackle the Jaws timeline. We are going to go where no Jaws show has ever gone. And I want to thank you for returning to the Jaws Obsession, where we are here to share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. Before we get into that, I would like to thank you, the listening audience, for pushing this show to the next level. For the first five days of April, we were up 290% in downloads over the first five days in March. Also, what is very exciting is you, everyone out there has been... Uh, talking about it and helping us push this show out to new listeners. And it's exciting to announce that with the statistics from episode 14 and episode 15, uh, statistically, we are now in the top 25% of podcasts worldwide. And that's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a large number, right? So we have, according to listennotes.com, there's 2.8 million podcasts available with everyone that's been listening and sh- and and donating their time uh, with everybody that's been helping us uh, push this show out we are now in the top 25% of that 2.8 million so it's still a big large it's a big you know it's still a big pond to be in however it's nice to be in that top 25% so thank you very much for everyone that's been listening if everyone can find someone new to mention the show to, we're, we're only going to go up. And that's what we need before episode 20. We need everybody in this together because we, only together can we do great things. So uh, today we have a lot to unpack here. We have a lot to go over. This is episode 16, the Jaws timeline, a.k.a the Brody Redemption episode. Now, back in episode 10, we proved that Chief Brody was the one who made the pivotal error that causes the Orca's engine to explode. So so Jaws makes Chief Brody look like a fish out of water in many ways. In many ways, and, and that's how we all would look. We all have our own personal careers. If you took me and put me in, in a place that I am not familiar with. If you put me in the middle of a, of a cornfield with two other guys on a tractor combine, I would be fumbling around and not knowing what to do as well. But what this episode does is that we're going to examine what Chief Brody's actual skills are, and we are going to prove that he was a very, very savvy police detective. So in order to show that Chief Brody... It has a lot more going on 
than what JAWS uh, initially shows up front. You have to look into the details. So we have a lot of notes here to go over. I'm going to try to get through this as efficiently and as e effectively as possible. Before I do, uh, if you go, if everyone goes to uh, JAWSOB.com on the contacts page, you can go to our Telegram channel over at Telegram at JAWSOB. Or you can go to our Discord server. Uh, you can find the content. You can find the links to those on the contact page of our website, jawsob.com. Over there, I'm going to have these show notes that I'm going to be referencing, and you can follow along. We're also going to have a calendar graphic that shows uh, the exact calendars from uh, the end of June and the beginning of July, 1974, of when the movie takes place. Now, let's keep in mind that this these dates do not coincide with the actual dates of July 19 June and July of 1974. Remember, in early episodes, we explained that Jaws uses a hyper reality where we have real life situations but in a fictional island. So what they did was using the ma using the dates and times they gave and the clues in the movie, they created their own alternate timeline. And that's the timeline we have to establish here that it is not the exact timeline. If you go back and look at old calendars from July 1974, these dates have shifted. So when people do that, they do that in error because everybody's referencing certain dates and times and they don't fit with what is historically accurate. But in the Jaws universe, these dates all fit right together and we are going to prove that right now. So what we start with, we start with the official Jaws movie timeline. Let's get into this. Jaws Jaws begins on Friday, June 27th, 1974, between 0500, 5 in the morning, and 529, Chrissy Watkins is attacked. What is our proof of this? The records show that sunrise was at 5 to 529 a.m. on that date in history back in 1974. We know from the lighting with the moon that's hanging overhead, and then, of course, you see the sunrise starting to come up, so we know that she is attacked between 5 and 5.29 in the morning. Uh, this works out also with the science that this is when great whites will hunt, will have predations on seals during the early morning, during the dawn hours, right before sunrise. That's when they're ambush predators, and that's when they will be uh, hunting for food. So this works out with the science. Friday, June 27th, 1974, is a routine work day for Chief. He's grabbing his uniform once he's out of bed. This and this and So this can't be a Saturday. He's getting up like he does every other weekday. We also have Polly showing up at the office, possibly after her lunch break. She says, you're up awful early to Hendrix. Hendrix is the night deputy. He usually works the night hours, so she's not used to seeing him there between 10 and noon is when she is, or, you know, closer to noon is when she is getting to the office. So she says, you're up awful early because Hendricks never left to go to sleep. He's still at the office. Uh, there's also a complainer in the office, the old man that comes in, and it's not very Saturday-like. It seems the feel on it and also in the streets, it seems to be a routine weekday stuff where people are getting ready for the summer season to start. So between 10 a.m. and noon on Friday, that Friday, we have the crime. We would we would have had the crime scene photography and recovery of Chrissy Watkins's body. We have the coroner examination. Uh, that and then we have the phone call to Chief from the medical examiner, uh, where he's at his typewriter. And then you'll have the phone call. There would be a, there would have been a phone call to the mayor from the medical examiner, and then the mayor would have called Meadows. So it brings them all out of the office at, at once. So you have Chief walking down, you have the medical examiner walking out, you have Meadows, the reporter, walking out of the Amity Gazette office, and, as, uh, and, and of course we have the mayor and the selectman walking out of uh, the office from Vaughn Realty. Between noon and 1 p.m., we're going to have the hardware store scene, and then that's where the after that shortly after that is the meeting on the Amity Harbor ferry. So that would that will take place all in the first day on that Friday. Then the movie skips over Saturday, June twenty eighth, nineteen seventy four. So there is a Saturday that happens. We are not shown in the movie. We actually jump to Sunday, June twenty ninth, nineteen seventy four, the day at the a day at the beach with the Brody family and Alec and the Alex Kittner attack. What's our proof of this date? The cardboard sign at the town hall later states, quote, the shark that killed Alex M. Kittner on Sunday, June 29th on Amity Town Beach. This allows us to combine a day of the week 
with the date and work our way backwards and forwards to prove this calendar that I am working off of here. So that, that cardboard reward sign was very pivotal in establishing a day of the week and a date. So this also explains Chief allowing his kids to go in the water at the beach on this Sunday. He has now, it has now been two full days, over 48 hours since the Chrissy Watkins attack. But his detective skills are still working and he's still on guard, but he's kind of convincing himself in many ways, he's trying to convince himself that it's okay to go back in the water. So he typically, this wouldn't have been happening on the day after or the same day. Some... You, you might think that it all happens in the same day. It doesn't. So, so there, there is this spreading out of events, which leads, that, and these are little clues that you can show that the events are more spread out. They're not, they're not on subsequent days. They're not even on the same day. They're, this is actually separated. So we know that Sunday, June 29th was the Kittner attack. So now that takes us to the following day, which is Monday, June 30th, 1974. Mrs. Kittner places the ad for the $3,000 bounty on the shark that killed Alex. So signs are placed around the island and also in newspapers, local and out of town. We hear Meadows, the reporter, saying he, he's burying the ad to the back of the Amity, Amity Gazette with the grocery ads. Uh, this is also the date, obviously, with the meeting at the town hall and with Quint's chalkboard speech. So this is on Monday, June 30th. June 30th. Beach closed signs are installed at South Beach and other beaches around the island. So then what is our proof of all this? We actually have the dialogue from Ellen Brody where she says, uh, uh, quote, hey, Mikey really loves his present. Another quote, Martin, it's, it's his birthday tomorrow. And then another quote, I don't know if he'll ever go in the water again after what happened yesterday. So we know that the what happened yesterday, the Kittner attack was on Sunday. They're now having the talk on Monday about his birthday is tomorrow. Mikey's birthday is tomorrow. Um, and then, then they cut away to, they go to the night attack on Charlie and Den Herder and the doc with the holiday roast. So that, those, that would be the local guys hearing about the bounty from the signs placed around the island on that Monday. So everything fits for that Monday. What we are not shown now is Michael Brody's birthday on Tuesday, July 1st. This day is not shown in the movie. So this day we skip over and then we go right to Wednesday, July 2nd, 1974, where we are at Amity Harbor and the fishermen are arriving in big crowds to hunt for the shark. It's chaos. We have Matt Hooper arriving on the island on Wednesday, July 2nd, 1974. He's doing the autopsy of Christine Watkins. Uh, the tiger shark is caught. Mrs. Kittner's slap occurs on this day. She is saying, quote, a girl got killed here last week and you knew it. This proves our initial date of Friday, June 27th of the Christine Watkins attack by her saying that a girl got killed here last week. That is is indeed the prior week because that would have been on the Friday and we are now on a Wednesday when Mrs. Kittner is confronting Chief. This also gives time for the reason they, they skip over the Tuesday is the Tuesday is, is when the print is going to run the print ads that Mrs. Kittner took in out of the town newspapers. So she called the ads in on Monday. They're going to be in the newspapers on Tuesday. Fishermen are flooding the island on Wednesday. So do you see? So that's where this all works out is we skip over that Tuesday and we go to Wednesday, July 2nd. Also on that Wednesday, July 2nd, Hooper still hasn't found a restaurant, so he's starving and he eats Brody's dinner. So there, th that shows you that we're still on this same day, Wednesday, July 2nd. There's the tiger shark autopsy and then discovery of Ben Gardner's boat and body by Hooper and Brody later that night. So now we go to the following day. Thursday, July 3rd, 1974, we have a meeting with the mayor at the vandalized billboard. Our proof of this is the quote, tomorrow's the 4th of July and we will be open for business, end quote. So now that is another definitive mark in the movie of we are on July 3rd. So everything lines up so far that the uh, we are on July 3rd, and tomorrow is the 4th of July, according to the mayor. Later that day, now this is where it gets tricky. Later that day, we have the tourist arrival montage, uh, which is a combination of 
the events happening late afternoon, July 3rd, and the morning of July 4th. So later that afternoon, we have a late afternoon sun coming through the Brody's house um, through their back porch where Chief and who, Chief Brody and Hooper are on the phone. Uh, uh, Hooper is wearing the same clothes as the billboard meeting, proving that Hooper and Brody uh, are on the phones marshalling the Coast Guard and the shark spotters for the next day on the beaches, uh, which would be the 4th of July. So they're hitting the phones on that late afternoon of the 3rd of July while we're seeing tourists arriving in a montage sort of way the morning of the 4th of July, which is the start of the tourist season. So after that music stops by John Williams, we see the video game. We are now right on the Friday, July 4th, 1974. We have the panic at the beach. We have the estuary victim is attacked. Michael Brody is sent to the hospital. And then the mayor signs the voucher to give Brody the funding to hire Quint to kill the shark. That's all on the 4th of July, 1974, which is a Friday. This now transitions to Saturday, July 5th, 1974, meeting with Quint at Quint's Shark and Shack, where the terms of the charter are discussed, uh, and Hooper is brought on as third mate. That's just all in one day. Now we go to Sunday, July 6th, 1974, where Quint, Brody, and Hooper leave on the Orca late afternoon. What's our proof of this is it's a late afternoon lighting, but also the quote, break it up, will you, Chief? Daylight's wasting. So we're clearly not in the early morning when typically a charter would leave first thing in the morning. No, this is late afternoon because they're rushing this. So the charter's uh, terms were settled on Saturday, July 5th with the meeting at Quint Shark and Shack. Now it gets a whole calendar day where... Hooper can now get his equipment. This gives enough time for Hooper to get all his gear shipped over from the mainland and get that gear assembled at the dock. Also, uh, Chief Brody can go home and he can pack and Ellen helps him pack. So that's later on in the day. They're all meeting at the Orca and they all leave. The three of them leave late afternoon, Sunday, July 6, 1974. What's not shown is the first overnight on the water with the orca. They definitely spent an over the initial oak overnight on the water in the orca that Sunday night. We now we are now transitioned through the dissolve to the bloody water the morning of Monday, July 7th, 1974. We start early morning on a hunt for the shark with a chum line started. The shark is sighted. Ellen tries to hail the orca from the Coast Guard Station Amity Point. This, this also explains, see, now this is following, so they've already been at sea for almost, for almost a day. Now this explains why we are in the next day is Ellen, uh, being an experienced police officer's wife, would not have tried to call the orca the same day. She wouldn't have just, like, they, they wouldn't, as the movie, if some people understand it, is they take off in the orca and then all of a sudden they get a chum line going and the shark shows up and she's trying to hail the orca from the Coast Guard station. Well, she wouldn't do that because she knows that she's a police officer's wife. She does, she's not going to constantly be checking in. But the next day, that would that would be apt for her to drive down to Amity Point, go to the Coast Guard station and say, I'd like to try to hail the orca and see how they're doing. And so Quint tries to tell her they will be home for dinner that night. So uh, that's all on Monday, July 7th. Also, one barrel in the shark with the SDU 5E strobe light. And on the night of, of Monday, July 7th, 1974, is when we have the USS Indianapolis speech and the shark attacks the orca. So then we, after that, we go, now we transition to Tuesday, July 8th, 1974, where we have the final battle with the shark, Hooper in the cage, Quint's demise, the shark is killed. What's our proof of this? Is Brody asks when they're swimming away, what day is this? And Hooper responds, it's Wednesday. Uh, it's Tuesday, I think. And that's correct. He is right. It is Tuesday, July 8th, 1974. And there you have it, the 12 calendar days of the Jaws timeline. Now, I understand that was a lot. That was a lot to process. So if you go and look at the graphic we have of the calendar, 
you actually can have a visual and you can see right there in calendar square form of the JAWS timeline. So now that we have a JAWS timeline, now we can go to what has bothered many a JAWS fans, including myself, over the years. What we have at the beginning of the movie, when Chief Brody is typing on his typewriter, and if everyone just looks at the title card for this episode 16 of the Jaws Obsession, you're going to see that the cutaway they used has a date, time, deceased, discovered, 7274, 1020 p.m., date, time, death, occurred, 7174, 1150 p.m. And everyone always writes this off as a continuity error, and they say that it's all wrong and it doesn't fit. Well, we at the Jaws Obsession are here to tell you that it definitely fits. And to do this, you have to talk to professionals and find out exactly what, remember this is 1974, what exactly is Chief Brody doing here with altered dates on a report? I consider this an anomaly. This is not a continuity error. Continuity error is when someone falls in the water not wearing shoes and then you see their foot and they have sh a shoe on. That, that is a continuity error and that is every movie has continuity errors. Those are very hard to control. When you shoot movies that are not in sequential order, and many times you have someone wearing the same wardrobe but maybe the collar is up or two buttons are buttoned and then you come back for a cutaway two weeks later and now three buttons are unbuttoned and everyone says, hey, look, there's a continuity error. Yes, every movie has that and you can pick apart any movie there is, you'll find continuity errors. But this is a little egregious to be a continuity error. This is called an anomaly. And what we have to do now is we have to figure out why would they leave such an anomaly in the movie unless it meant something. And that's what I was, I have been working with John Tedder and we have really kind of been hammering out possibilities and what was going on. What I initially had to do was I had to, we had to, we had to realize there was two things happening here. Uh, Spielberg and uh, Steven Spielberg and Verna Fields, his editor, the editor on the movie, they were editing daily. So they were constantly putting these scenes together with pickup shots and, on, on, and everything they got back so they could edit these scenes. Uh, many days there was nothing to do on set because the shark was not working. If this was a mistake, a pickup shot with a typewriter is probably the easiest thing they could have done if they would have said, hey, that date doesn't match with the cardboard sign we have hanging in the town hall. Also, we have history that shows Spielberg was not beyond spending his own money to reshoot a pickup shot. Famously, what he did was he spent his own money to reshoot the jump scare of the Ben Gardner head and torso popping out of the bottom of the boat with Matt Hooper. And that gave a bigger scare. He actually spent his own money to stage that and film that after production was done. So Spielberg was not beyond getting reshoots or even spending his own money to shoot a pickup shot. So we have to now say that they left this in the movie because it meant something. So now it's up to us to figure out what does it mean. And that's where I said, the only way I can figure this out is I have to find a police officer from the 1970s era that I can actually sit and interview and actually try to see if we can find out exactly what he's doing here. Just to let everybody know, the Jaws Obsession is a smaller part of a bigger project that I have been working on for now 19 to 20 months. And when I do research into this, what I do is I have questions and I do interviews. The, I just do this so I can get facts and then I would write it up and then I would report it back to you. But what I want to do here is just play you a section of the interview of myself working out with a retired police detective, the details in the movie and the magic happens is we stumble upon the answer in the middle of it all. And I wanted to share with you out there in the Jaws obsession that these are how things are, uh, that it's, it's neat how things are done. So without, this isn't very produced. We, it's not, this is not a formal interview where I had pre-written questions up and I went one at a time and I got answers. So what I did was I was able to find 
retired detective Muggsy McGraw. 30 years in law enforcement. He started in 1968. He retired in 1998. This guy is in the era. He worked in the era of typewriter, police forms, all of that. And he has, he brings impeccable credentials to look into this anomaly. In total, this interview was 30 minutes long, but I took it down to sections. And one thing to keep in mind during the interview is this was during the research phase of the creation of the Jaws timeline. So the dates that we're kicking around of when the body is discovered are wrong. Uh, we're saying uh, the 29th, 28th, but it was really the 27th of June. Please excuse that part of the interview. This was conducted before we we locked in all these dates. Please do not let that distract you from what is actually revealed here. So from Syracuse, New York, let's get to the interview with retired police detective Muggsy McGraw. What you're going to hear is us stumbling upon the answer and locking down exactly what Chief Brody is doing at, in his office at the typewriter at the beginning of Jaws. It was a shark. He's filling out a report, and it says 7274, date time deceased discovered, uh, date time death occurred 7174. I'm trying to say what reason would he have to push those dates that I, up I mean, I, in I, your opinion? I don't know. It's, uh, I mean, if the coroner goes with that but i mean if somebody else has to i mean if they're just saying it was a boating accident yeah the reports that i was involved with and then i was in the job in the 70s we would take the report i oh. mean like a dead body or something which it was right yep right? yep I mean, right found peace. so what you do is that whoever finds the body that's the person that uh, you write their name down and anybody who was there witnesses or where they found it so on and so on time you found it in the day right you know what so walking the beach or whatever in the normal routine like let's say he came from new york city it, right he would do this this is just standard protocol but right now he's now this is his first summer as the chief of police of an of an island that is three days from everywhere you know it's it's not martha's vineyard it's not it's not nantucket it's amity island which is like an outlier island is what we're going to prove later on so he's pretty much the first time they've ever had a chief of police so it's and it's also there's this there is this um mayor there and there is a political persuasion over the whole event when they find the body and what it is is they try to say that it's a boat accident not a shark attack even though the coroner at the beginning says it's a it's a shark attack they have a right. meeting with the chief and kind of shake him down and say, listen, you yell shark, you create a panic on, on the 4th of July. Correct. Yeah, so, it's coming back. Right, so we're going to call it, it's a boat accident. And he turns to the corner and he says, so you'll stand by that? And the corner says, yes, I'll stand by you. And I think at that point, chief is, has to play CYA covering his ass. Right. And, and, there, is, and there is why... I'll, everyone thinks it's a mistake at the beginning of the movie, and I don't believe it was a mistake. He's filling out the report, but he's dating at 7274, even though the girl was killed and they found the body on June 29th. So my, right. my question is this, is there is a reason why he's pushing those dates, and I'm thinking, that's what, is it possible to push the dates? I remember the mayor gave him a tough time saying, yes, that, that's, we got the... Uh... A lot of people coming here for the Fourth of July, and yes, some are going to scare away all our money, and the money's going to be gone. What are we going to do? And yep, I I don't know. Uh, like the you get, I mean, you find the body. The body's found on six twenty nine, right? Yeah. So, and the me gets the body that evening or that early morning hours. They get that in the morning, in. and he's already. I don't know. And the mayor's already telling him right. it's a boat I don't know accident. How he can change the date on that? We are dealing with a fictional island with a fictional situation. Well, um, Correct. What one thing that's interesting is that in um, in uh, this is only f six years after, and the doctor that's in the movie, Doctor Nevin, he was the same doctor that was in Edgartown that was on vacation when Ted Kennedy uh, drove Mary Mary Joe Kopechny off of uh, oh, off the bridge the and Critic. And yeah, yep, correct. and he was off on vacation, and in one week, the 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 doctor they brought in said, "Oh, she just died because she was drunk, and there was no there was nothing else going on." 
and they didn't do a full autopsy. They just did a, a blood toxicology, and they everything was done. By the time Dr. Nevin got back, he was very upset that, that there was this, they didn't go the full protocol. And this is the same doctor that they used on the set of Jaws. I think there was this whole fear, this whole mode of at the time was, uh, you know, politicians can come in and change paperwork around in order. That looks like it ought to happen to me. Right. So here's Chief Brody at that point. This is only six years after Chappaquiddick. And he's going, okay, I'm not going to get caught. You know, I'm not going to get hung out to dry on this. I'm going to bring my own person in and I'm going to have him, but I'm not going to let them take this body of this girl away. So what do I have to do to do that? Ah, uh, that's, 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 I know that's it's a, a tough one. Does right. the chief of police have an equal amount of power as the mayor? Like, can the mayor just come in and. No, the mayor is the one that, I mean, probably the way that I understand it from the way he got hired and the mayor was holding his head. Yep. Like to the chopping block. Yep. I mean, he's worried about his job. He's settled down. He's just sat there. Holy Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And he's worried. He's worried about more people getting eaten. Yep. And the mayor doesn't want to, you know, scare everybody, keep everybody away. But, you know, if this shark comes back. It's, yes. It's going to it's going to eat it, you know, and, and then 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 what he's I mean, trying I to do is by changing the date that would save him because he's falsified the report already. And, okay. And the. Uh, medical examiner the medical examiner is i think in mass the number one person right right i mean if he falsifies that in front of the chief of police and the mayor the -hmm. mayor goes well i was just there and you know i mean we uh we were just talking and they said it's a boat accident yeah i mean how does he get around that i mean all three of them are liable Let's say you did seven, you, you did the date when the body was found and you put it as Jane Doe. Does that a poor, right, Yeah, it, I mean, nobody knows who it was, right? At the time. Right, right. So let's say he filled out a report that was June 29th, Jane Doe. Right. Now, yeah. at that time in the 70s, if you discovered her identity, would you then go back and amend that report? And then you would say, okay, we, uh, you know, this is the report now, it's now... Chrissy Watkins is was the girl's name in the movie, but we now right. fa- we found we we found this is her identity and stuff like that. So, you you know they don't they wouldn't report Jane Doe in the newspapers, correct? In the media. Well, the uh, the, the report, the initial report of the investigation. Okay. Jane Doe. Then you add a supplement to the report when they found out who what her name was. Okay. After the investigation, but you put all the information that the ME gives you. Right. Dr. So-and-so reports that it was a shark bite or no, he doesn't. He reported it to me that right. it was a boating accident or, I mean, I don't know how that looked like shark bites. Uh, yeah. yeah. So could this have been a supplement to, because he doesn't have, you know how they have standard forms? Could, yeah. Could this I, have been exactly. a, could this have been a supplement that he's typing up? To it the could one could have been the supplement. That's her name when they found out her name. He might yeah, have did that on seven two when he found out her name supplement. Uh, we'll see whatever. So so we might be onto something here. So if when you find the victim's name, is that when it right. would get reported in the media like um, girl right. identified that's or a supplement report? That's a supplement report, and now the family can get notified, correct? Yeah. In the Syracuse Police Fire, the 15 is the original 15, 19, but then you put in a supplement report. Right. And th- is, is an, uh, yeah, another code 19. That's what the way it was with the Syracuse this Police is Fire. Per- I was- now this matches up. So now he's made, okay, so this is what, so let's say you have a Jane Doe and you discover a body. And there's no identity, right? Jane Doe. Jane Doe. If there is and if the, age and a, I mean, where you found the body? Yeah, where, yeah all the, all, yep, where you found her and all that stuff, the date, right. the time, and yeah, stuff location. like. And yeah. then what the coroner thinks happens. See, it's my, it's my assumption is that he's trying to hold the body long enough to get a expert onto the island to examine it. So let's say it was Jane Doe. 
How long do they hold Jane Doe's? And let's say no identity is ever found before well, they... they can hold they can hold the body for I mean in, in, in the morgue for you know until they deem it necessary that mm-hmm. everything you've done everything to complete that investigation. Once you let's say you have a Jane Doe for three four days in the morgue, and then the identity right. is discovered. What kind of would be the average time that you have to notify the family? The family comes down and claims the body and then all that stuff. Is that like a Yeah, t- you notify, yeah. As soon as you're notified, okay, we found out it was so, so and so. That's when the notifications are made shortly thereafter. Okay. So I think I think we just cracked it. I think this was a supplement form. He was, It was. It he, had to be. So he was putting in her identity as a supplement form. And this was the date that he was going to type it up. So he's basically buying himself some time. You see, yeah. you, see I mean, yeah. you see what I'm saying? It's like if if, yeah. he's, if they got a Jane Doe, then the coroner can say, and he can be under political persuasion, can say, oh, it was a boating accident. And then he can go, yeah, it's a boating accident. But... Well, Once which the, they knew it wasn't a boating accident. Correct. They, they, all knew, they all knew it wasn't, the but... Three of them knew that it was a shark bite. Yes. But if you file a supplemental... What would you call it? Once they got her name, yeah. Then you file the supp- it's a supplemental form. It's a supplemental report. Supplemental correct. report. Now there's a whole new clock starts. So now it's like, now we have her, now we have to ca- ca- get the family. So you extend that clock just a little bit more, a little bit more. And now you get the scientist on, and then he comes on, and he says, this was definitely not a boat accident. This was a shark. And now, yes. now it's all official. So now the chief just basically played CYA. He covered his ass, right? He, I hope he did. Yeah, <laughs> I think I remember correctly. Yeah, I wanted to slap the mayor. I think. Yeah, that's a, that's the thing is because there's a kid that gets killed on the 29th. And yeah, I mean it was it was sad, you know. I mean, yeah. uh, I remember that they're all coming in from the ocean, right? Yes, yes, yes. And then there's a there, and little then, boy on a. a yep. The, the next day, the shark comes back and kills. And so the the mom of that boy blames the chief, saying, you knew there was a girl that was attacked. And the mayor's right. trying to say, oh, she's wrong. And he goes, no, she wasn't. But but the simple fact is, is that that wasn't put in the papers because they didn't report it as this is that they have the identity of the girl and all that stuff. The mayor was concerned about losing all the, the, yes. All the Jacksons. Yes. So I think you're right. I think what he was doing is, I think we have it down. This was a supplemental report, report. that he was yep. typing in. And since when he they, found out the name of the girl. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So, yeah. So I think that's that's all the questions I got for you. That was about it. I appreciate it so much, sir. Thank you so much for, oh. your, for your time. Anytime, Ryan. Absolutely, absolutely. I'll talk to you a little bit later then. All right. Good luck with the show. Thank you. And that was retired police detective Muggsy McGraw from the Syracuse Police Department, bringing 30 years of law enforcement experience to the Jaws obsession to help us boil this down and finally figure out the Jaws timeline. So in closing, what I would like to do is synthesize all of this down with all this information, bring this um, entire idea to a close so we can settle once and for all that we have a solid Jaws timeline here. There aren't any continuity errors. This was all purposely done, and this was all part of a bigger picture of what's happening behind the scenes of Jaws. What we now can tell from all of this, from our interview with Detective Muggsy McGraw, from all the lines in the movie and from the calendar we drew up, what we now can show is Chief Brody is the only one with Chrissy Watkins' purse and ID at the, at the scene of the discovery of the body. Not even Cassidy knows who she is. He doesn't even know her name. So uh, that's the boy on the beach. So this is Chief's ace up the sleeve. This is his way of controlling the situation. Remember we talked about in Jaws Communication, Chief Brody's initial reaction when seeing the shark was to control the situation, figure out what his resources are. Can he bring more resources in to control the situation? So what we have is we have Chief controlling the situation. The chief already suspects a shark attack, and yet he can't officially confirm it. Remember, he makes the quote, in 25 years, there hasn't been a shooting or murder in this town, as chief tells Hooper later on during the night search for Ben Gardner's boat. So chief initially won't fill out a report with all her info to finalize it until he gets an expert in there to examine the body. He just has a feeling about this as a chief of police. But remember what we're dealing with here. 
And I also went over this in the longer interview. There's much more to the interview with Muggsy McGraw. In order for Chief to get hired as a chief, he would have been a, he would have reached the level of and rank of detective for the New York City Police Department. And you don't reach that level without anywhere from 10 to 20 years experience. So what, what we actually deduced was that Chief retired and took a pension from the New York City Police Department and then jumped on and got hired as the chief of police for Amity Island. So that puts him, if he started, let's say he started the police force at 22, 23, that puts him at 42, 43, 44 years old in Jaws, where he is now the chief of police. But what he is also is an experienced detective. This guy knows crime scenes. He knows murder scenes. He also knows police reporting. He knows the paperwork side of the business. So we have to put ourselves into the chief's mindset on Friday morning of June 27th, 1974. In order to, number one, control the narrative and the situation, chief does not want the rumor of a murder to get out, but he also wants to prove his gut feeling that there's a shark involved. He looks back at the water. He says, this is definitely a shark. Uh, And this is even before the coroner calls him. So, and number two, he keeps the reporters and any shady political dealings from interfering. There hasn't been a murder in 25 years. So there is clearly a record of crime free on this island. And Chief does not want to be the first on his first summer to have to let that record go. So what he wants to do is he wants every, he wants the I's dotted and the T's crossed. So therefore he is going to control the situation. He's going to decide to file the report as a Jane Doe which is the classification for a victim without an identity. So he is not, he is going to withhold her identity. This explains why everybody in the movie, including the mayor, include everybody is a summer girl, the girl, the girl on the beach. She really doesn't have an identity because chief is holding that back. When we catch him in his office, we see him typing up the supplemental report with Chrissy's name and information because he is referencing her ID in her wallet when typing. He's looking over at her wallet there. So we also see her name on the report. When you play it frame by frame, you see her name and her description, but the dates are wrong. The dates that we see are 7174, July 1st, 74, 1150 p.m. uh, would be when he found the ID. Not, although it's he's putting it in the date time deceased discovered, that would be when he found the ID and then 7274, 10, 20 PM would be for when he is filing the supplemental information on July 2nd. Why is he filling in these times in date deceased discovered and date death occurred? Because Amity PD doesn't have the correct documentation for a supplemental report to amend an initial report. So he is just using the initial report document, but using those spaces to put the dates of anticipated supplemental amendment, okay? He is doing this because he already knows that the Oceanographic Institute will be sending an expert out sometime mid-next week. And Matt Hooper then ends up arriving on 7274, which is the date we see on the report that he's typing to examine the body. So his supplemental report is, he believes, is going to be concluded in 7274. So this piece of police maneuvering is Brody covering his rear end and making sure he now has ample time to get an expert onto the island to prove detailed analysis of the body. He's extending that clock. However, when he receives the phone call from the coroner, the the medical examiner tells him, shark attack. Now he types it on the paper. He leaves that whole method on the table. He gets up, chief jumps into action without hesitation. Now he has the confirmation of what he wanted to do already, which was close the beaches and protect the swimmers. But as we all know, the mayor, uh, the media lackey Meadows, along with the medical examiner, they corner the chief on the ferry before he can go and tell anyone of the shark. So after Alex Kittner is murdered on the 29th and even on the 30th, the following day at the town hall, there is no talk of the first shark attack. The lady next to the reward sign saying, I don't even believe there is a shark, she says. Chief Brody would then go back once Matt Hooper was on his way out on July 2nd and file that supplemental report, legally identifying the girl, but also now on that same date, 
the cause can be changed officially to shark attack because Matt Hooper now is there to confirm it. And you can see when they walk into the autopsy scene, you can see Chief Brody and Hooper had a conversation. You can almost see Chief's body language and his facial expression, how he points out, let's show him our boating accident. He points out this and the part on the paper where it's listed as probable boating accident. There's a lot more going on behind the scenes that we are not shown here. So ultimately, the chief would never have officially signed off on the cause of death as boat accident because the supplemental report was not filed at that time. This proves that the chief was very, very good with a pencil, and he knew the ins and outs of police work enough to sidestep political roadblocks and, you know, and the legal landmines in order to solve a case. This sequence of events, how good was, uh, and, and let's say you think that this is all made up. This is all crazy talk. Let's say, uh, let's say, you know what? The Jaws obsession has, the Jaws obsession has jumped the shark on this one. Uh, there's no way this is, this sounds a little far-fetched. Well, they even have proof of how good chief was with paperwork in anticipation of events to come because after the estuary attack on his child and the estuary victim uh, on the 4th of July, Brody confronts the mayor at the hospital and he already has a voucher to hire Quint typed up and ready for signature and stuffed in his back pocket because he knew this was going to happen again. His police intuition told him it would, as did the science, Matt Hooper, so he cornered the mayor with the paperwork that he already had prepared beforehand. So what happens is the mayor thought they were hiring a chief of police that they could kind of push around. The guy doesn't even like to, he's never been on an island. He doesn't know about island life. But what they didn't anticipate was this guy, he was going to work wonders with police paperwork. Chief Brody was an excellent police officer and a decorated detective from New York City. Let's not forget that. You don't get to that level without being successful in doing police work well. So Brody shows, but also Spielberg shows, by leaving the cutaway of the typewriter with the future dates on Brody's typewriter in the movie, that there was a lot more going on in this sequence of the movie that we are shown. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired, I want to go to bed. I had a little think about it all. I'm out of breath. I feel like I just ran a marathon. Ooh. The movie Jaws is copyrighted property of Universal Studios. Any references and sampling from the movie Jaws in this episode is intended to fall within Section 107 of the Copyright Act. The copyrighted materials are fairly used for the purposes of criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, and research. The materials used here are protected by the fair use guidelines of Section 107 of the Copyright Act, all rights reserved to the copyright owners. And there we have the official 12 calendar days of JAWS. It all makes sense now. And we had to get through this because this is all information that we won't have time to go over later on in the sh uh, with future episodes. These future episodes just get bigger and bigger, and we're building up to, obviously, episode 20. We're that much closer to episode 20. So I would like to thank everybody for their time and listening. We like to be efficient with our time, but we have a lot of material to go over. So... Also, I'd like to thank John Tedder of Quince Shark and Shack over at Etsy.com because he worked with me through crazy hours throughout the night to get all this information together. And without his help, I never could have done it. So thanks, John. Please go visit him at Quince Shark and Shack over at Etsy.com. You can find the information in the description of this broadcast in whatever platform you're listening on. Please, everyone, remember to like, subscribe, write some good reviews, give us a good rating. Thank you for listening. Until next week, farewell and adieu and show me the way to go home.